Okay, uh, the light is blinking and the numbers are moving sequentially. Okay, we're live. All right. Thank you for being here. This is part nine. I'm almost not believing this already. Part nine, all right. But uh, uh, I made a new graphic. I changed it. It's there, part nine. Okay, yeah, that's right. I did talk in previous videos about a bunch of other stuff. Um, yeah, okay, so we are, uh, um, uh, you know, my fun little graphic here is, the, you know, representing them taking the, uh, the computer, swapping out, right? This represents um, hardware that they're, uh, and this is not literally what they're, they're doing. It's a schematic, uh, but it's a fun dialogue, it's clickbait uh, I don't know, if it got you here it worked, who knows but it's my original graphic um, uh, you know, it goes in the show, you know um, what is the um, the lines there you know, a data, this is uh, um, now it's rare to find this, but it's there, it was there, I was there I got it um, <clears throat> it's, it's a void now, uh, but not to us um and so, okay, so these are components that are n not literally, strictly speaking, hot swap. But as I've mentioned before, I don't, I don't have any pictures of hot swap hard drives. And if I did, it, they wouldn't be nearly as glorious or as relevant as, as these fine gems <clears throat> here. So they are, you know, schematic. They serve a point. They mark a point next to here, next to our amplitude and quality. And these actually are, both of these technically are for... Um, uh, these, uh, if you, you know, hey, I'm getting your attention here. These were for the, uh, the, the magnetic, the, uh, coil. These are, am that's an amplifier and that's like a preamp unit or I don't, I think that actually may be a filter. Um, I don't want to get into whatever it is, but, uh, you know, the point is that, um, All right, so, um, oh yeah, that's a, a, the, a, the filter, the double notch. All right, so, <clears throat> um, the, the relevance of this is not which, necessarily which component they, they hot swapped, although, uh, I want to bring up the concept. Oh, yeah, my... uh, I'll let you on over there, buddy. Um, all right, so we're on, uh, he's getting his groove on. Uh, shit, bro. So hot swap, the, the concept of hot swappable, it's not, um, uh, wonderful, 3.30 almost. Hot, uh, hot swappable, it's, when I worked doing the networking course, uh, learning about this, and in my own personal experience with computers and fixing them and all of that, there's m most times if you're, you know, relative to com computers, if you are going to swap out something on it, you got to shut it off. You know, if you, you're doing something in, inside of it, you know, you, you got to shut it off. Um, and in some cases, there's a residual charge that's built up in the thing. You got it like old school, you know, CRT tubes would have a, a charge, an accumulated charge. You got to ground it out, otherwise you're you're getting whacked with a high um, uh, amplitude. I think it's the flyback transformer. I think, if I remember correctly, uh, holds that charge. And the um, it's, a, it's the same thing with the old school power um, transformers that were in the um, computers. They would hold a residual charge. All right. So we are introducing the concept of hot swapping um, as a, a, a very relevant modern term that people don't think of um, relative to their devices that we have and we use the um, and so uh, when when 
we get that continuous set of lines at, at Tomsk, you know, we talk about the safe mode, we talk about the diagnostic, um, uh, hot swap is, like I said, with, with, with um, servers, with networks, you have a bank of the blades, they call them. And um, I don't want to go into it and show you pictures of computers, you know, and all of that. But they're narrow, they're blades, they call them. They, they fit in a rack for a server. And you could get, you know, five small kind of boards, main boards, set up in a bigger case. You know, they're all there for the same purpose. Uh, you know, it's a, an, an array, you know, and they all have the ability to access a bank of hard drives. So they keep uh, the main boards all together. They don't need a sound card. You know, they only have one input of a keyboard and a mouse. The rest of them are all processing the hard drives. These are blades. So each one is swappable. Ding, ding, ding. Uh, as per, you know, you can shut that, that one off. Or in the case of redundant systems, you have, uh, um, it's just a clip, you know, and you make sure you put it in the right order, you know, you're not going to, you know, jam it in there. And so because one, uh, one lead is a little longer than the other, and it's generally the negative lead that uh, is, is longer, and once you connect that, then the other one will naturally just pop in. It's like a circuit breaker. You know, a circuit breaker in, in the house, uh, what the heck you call it, in your household um, box in the basement. You know, I used to have to, you know, swap out the circuit breakers in, in the um, the electrical service at my, my mom's house growing up. Um, you know, there's a breaker for the pump. There's a, a circuit breaker for the... Uh, the washer, the dryer, the range, you know, I had to know them all by heart. So if the power went out, I could do it by feel, you know. They, we had replaced them, you know, so many times. I could almost do it by, well, I would, I would, I would do it by candlelight. You know, I'd flip the breaker, you know, and it's a temporary thing. But the rain would get in, the elements would get in, and I would have to, in, we'd have to insulate stuff in there because... The, the, the service to the house was old. So the elements had gotten in, and, and um, you know, this may or may not be part of the case of, of Tomsk, of the elements getting in, but, uh, you know, like, you know, this idea of the circuit breaker itself going bad. And so my grandfather had done the work on the house, and, you know, my mom grandmother, I'm sorry, had bought the plot in 1951 or so, you know, right around the time of Schumann. In 49, I think she had the plans. So my grandfather upgraded it from a, a, a he was a licensed electrician. He had um, upgraded it from a fuse box to a, a circuit breaker style, you know. And this is in the 60s, late 60s, I would think. Uh, maybe 64, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, around the time the first good Schumann, um, you know, machine, in 63, 64, five-ish, you know, the first good readings that they, they got, um, you know, were mo around that time moving from the, the fuse panel style to the circuit breaker style, okay? It was kind of an invention and innovation of its time. You know, it, it, when the, the, the circuit breaker gets too much of a voltage, it trips the, you know, it trips a switch and it dis, disconnects it, you know. And it can only do that so many times before you need to replace that circuit breaker. And while you're at it, we maybe we should also replace the box as well because the elements is rather than the box, but... Well, we couldn't afford to do the whole electric system because it's rather com complex, complicated to redo all of the, the wiring, you know. So I'm giving a long-winded story here, but, you know, of what, you know, the, 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 the different parts that are going into this, 
you know, like here, we're talking about, you know, hot swappable, hot swapping, that some of these parts, you can, um, you know, you reset it, you know, you've seen the data blackouts. In the last video, I had shown you that scanning overall, there was the one in January, I think, February, there was a, a big, um, January, February, somewhere around there, just actually... <clears throat> Yeah, there we go. Yeah, there we go. So here's, okay, here here's a data reset. Data reset, flip the breaker, flip the breaker, flip, flip. Oh, nice, that's a great tongue twister. You, know, you flip, flip the breaker, and then what happened here? Okay, these are white lines, the white out, white out. But this is for, like I said, the, 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 the uprights, these, the white guys are the, electrical antenna, that's the ball antenna. Okay, so the magnetic induction, the and, and the, um, apparently the electric signal is easier to get. It's a different type of antenna, it's easier to get. Okay, all right, all right. So, um, okay, I'm at 11 minutes, all right. So um, uh, we do have a, um, uh, the hot swap, uh, I want to read that, all right, so, <clears throat> i just read this real quick, and then I'm going to get on to the video from this guy who's an engineer, all right, so, 1144, very nice, okay, hot swapping, hot swap, all right, <laughs> I don't know if I increase it, uh, hot swapping from Wikipedia, um, hot swapping is the replacement or addition of components to a computer stop system without stopping, shutting down, or rebooting the system. Hot pluggable describes the addition of components only. Components, components, which have such functionality are said to be hot swappable or hot pluggable. Likewise, components which do not are cold swappable or cold pluggable. Most computer hardware, such as CPUs and memory, are only cold pluggable. However, it is common for high-end servers and mainframes to feature hot swappable capability for other components, such as PCEI and SATA drives. All right, so if you've ever used the SATA uh, uh, I have, you know, hard drives that have a cable that plug into the motherboard and you, you can, um, the, the power and the data are kind of in the same module and you can just plug it right in. Um, uh, amazing. It's coming right off the motherboard. It's getting the five volts that it needs there then. Uh, because SATA is a different ar archetype, blase, blah, 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 all right, whatever, okay. So, so, all right, um, PCA, okay, SATA, all right, oh, and that's a serial, SATA is serial, uh, so, uh, well, that doesn't say what the heck is SATA, what is it? Right. Bam, look at that, they give you a nice, uh, di uh, no, uh, nice graphic, yeah, uh, SATA, is a ser <clears throat> yeah. serial ATA is a computer bus interface that connects host bus adapters that's your motherboard host bus adapters to mass storage devices such as hard disk drives optical drives and solid state drives serial ATA seceded the earlier Parallel ATA, PADA, 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 uh, standard to become the predominant interface for storage devices. Oh, yeah, those things are a pain in the ass. That 16 connectors and two, or what were they, four, I think, array? Three? That's what it was. Uh, yeah, I think there were like 12, and then by, by three, if I remember correctly. Um, or no, maybe, yeah, there were 16, 16 by two. 
Yeah. But you got to make sure that all of them are in correctly seated properly and people would put them in upside down and wreck him and oh yeah they're a pain in the ass and that little pins were were a pain in the ass so um so here we talk about the different architecture going from the parallel to the serial ata okay optical drives so this is what my first kind of thought that they're they're you know um, uh, they're fiddling with, you know. I'm trying to think of a better word, but they're, you know, the backup drive <clears throat> being uh, hot swappable. Okay. Uh, all right. And so the USB. I think everyone knows what 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 USB is. Um, if you don't. Uh, USB standard. It's you know the the, the um, there's a lot of different actually a number of different standards with the USB now. There's I think they're up to the C with your phone. All right, this is relative, but this is just one particular diagram. Standard A, not to give you. This is the A type, uh, and this is the other receiving end of it. All right, so um, uh, there we're, we're on the topic of hot swappable. Okay, so just just uh, HDMI, um, you know, even like printers. I, in a, in a sense, the the parallel port for printers, I think, is I, I, technically maybe um, whoever is if there's a, it's still usable. I don't know if anyone uses them anymore. Um, I think, but that serial, the regular serial port, old school serial, I think it is. Um, plug and play. That's what that. This is the other way to put, you know, plug and play. You have everything is plug and play now, uh, but that's the, technically what this the 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 phrasing of this is. Um, but that architecture is only available on a newer style. So, I haven't said necessarily that that Tom's machines needed to be upgraded but perhaps they did in fact need to be upgraded in such a way to accept a type of you know PMP system a different protocol this is certainly a 32 bit um, system even though this is not 32 bits here this you know you get two bits or I guess technically four bits on this you get four states four bits or whatever but you know um uh, you know, it's there's a different protocol with the 32 bit that allows you to be able to receive that as an active thing that you 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 know you do not have to um, shut off the system, the main system, to be able to use that. This is quite an innovation. That's a fairly new thing relative to someone who's been working on computers for 26 years, almost getting close to 30 years, fiddling with these, you know, audio, technical, you know, stuff, technology, this kind of, this kind of stuff. All right, so, <clears throat> um, so, uh, so, all right, so, so buttons, so where are we? Hot swapping, all right, hot swap, all right, so, um, uh, I'm um, at a loss for figuring out where we are. All right. All right. Okay guys, so today I was modifying my receive front end. Now, I use this receiver to receive the Schumann resonance at about 7.5 Hertz. And I also use it as a general receiver that receives in the range of DC to about 192 kilohertz. Um, although I use it with a sound card 
and that really only allows us to receive DC to 90 kilohertz or so. Um, I modified it today because I, I actually used a BNC socket for the input and the input on this is very very high impedance and because of the fact that it's such a high impedance and I used a 50 ohm or 75 ohm BNC socket it tends to swamp that high impedance a bit and it reduces the sensitivity so what I've had to do was use a banana plug and put a socket on the metal box well insulated from the metal by lots of plastic and to try and create an actual high impedance uh, input to this uh, uh, front end. Okay, a quick description of the unit. Um, it's got a, an on-off switch obviously, there's two 9 volt batteries in there. There's a very sensitive uh, preamp in there and a FET. The, the purpose of this unit really is to convert a very, very high impedance down to a more manageable impedance that you can feed into a receiver or a sound card. So high impedance in at this end with the antenna, low impedance out at this end. So basically what it, all it really is is a, a, an impedance converter. What happens is if you were using an antenna that's say a meter or two or three meters long at uh, seven hertz for example, that antenna would have an impedance of hundreds of giga ohms and the signal would be absolutely tiny. And what this, what this converter does is basically converts that extremely high impedance down to something low impedance, which is more manageable, amplifies it a little bit, then sends it to your sound card or your receiver. From there, it gets amplified a little bit further onto a laptop or a computer and uh, some type of SDR software. So that, that's basically the unit in a nutshell. I thought it'd be a good idea today to actually demonstrate receiving a signal, transmitting and receiving a signal at one hertz or two or three hertz. We'll see how we go. We'll try to, we'll do one hertz. One hertz should be fine, but uh, maybe we'll go a little bit higher just to make life a little bit easier. So that's the unit. What I'll do now is I'll uh, stop, connect it all up, get started on the demo. Okay, I've now got the unit connected up via some RG58 coaxial cable. That comes through into my 24-bit um, 192 kilohertz sound card, which then goes to the laptop via a uh, shielded cable with a couple of uh, ferrite uh, chokes on the actual lead itself. Now we've got the software here. I'll just um, I need two hands here. We'll run the software. Now I'm using Spectrum Lab. For this demo because it's um it's really good when you're working with very very low frequencies it's very configurable as well you know just load some settings up that i've already pre um pre-done we'll use this uh, elf underscore rx jose user file which will basically set everything up the way i want it okay so that's on you, know, you see there's no signal there or anything happening at the moment. Sound card is on. Sound card's getting its power from the laptop. So everything is on except that. Now we'll turn that on. And now that we've got that on, we'll see something on the spectrum there. So we'll wait for that to settle. Now what this display, it seems a little bit slow, but what it's doing is it's averaging over time. When you're trying to receive a, a one hertz signal, uh, obviously you're only going to get a full cycle every second so the display you have to have it so that it averages over a bit of time so at the moment we're looking at a huge peak there which is the 50 hertz so that's the antenna itself the front end picking up 50 hertz mains frequency you've got the second harmonic at 100 hertz you've got the third harmonic at 150 hertz notice how the third harmonic is always stronger than the second harmonic and of course the actual 50 hertz, which is the source of that signal, is uh, actually off the scale. It's quite strong. If we look at the uh, spectrum there, you can see that both of those, or all of those, the 50 hertz plus the uh, harmonics are quite strong. All right, come back to the sound card. Now, I noticed straight away on the sound card that the red LED light is on, which means that it's being overloaded. So I'll try to turn it down a little bit 
I've got it on minimum, but it's still it's still flashing, which means that it's overloaded. So what I need to well, what's actually overloading the sound card is actually just 50 hertz mains frequency in this room. It's, it's actually overloading the sound card. So when the ADC in the sound card is overloaded, you start to get all kinds of weird effects and images and things. So to avoid that, I need to stop that from overloading. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to stop the video again, but I'll place a 50 hertz notch filter in line between the front end and the sound card, and that'll that'll block 50. Well, it won't block it fully, but it'll, it'll attenuate the 50 hertz considerably and stop the sound card ADC from being overloaded, which will help in our little experiment here. So I'll do. I'll stop the video and I'll do that now. Connect that up. Okay, we're back now. I've got my 50 hertz uh, twin T notch filter, which is um, fairly good at attenuating 50 hertz. Of course, it does nothing for the harmonics, say, at, uh, at 150 hertz uh, and up, but it definitely attenuates the 50 hertz, which is actually the strongest one, which is the one that usually gives you the most grief when you're doing these kind of experiments uh, in a built-up area or in your house, for that matter. Now you notice now the uh, red LED, the overload LED isn't on anymore, which means I can probably turn up the gain. There you go, I can turn up the gain to nearly three quarters before the actual overload LED comes on. So we can back that off, we don't have to have it very high. Actually I'll have it at minimum because we probably don't need to have it up too high. Maybe just a little bit more. Okay, so let's have a look at our spectrum again. Now one thing about this when you're receiving very very low frequencies now at the moment the spectrum display there's looking at between zero hertz and about 170 hertz now at those frequencies any movement in this room which i'm waving my hand about will cause the spectrum to go quite quite silly see now it's all settling back down again if I move my hand again, it'll kind of, especially the very, very low frequency, you notice how they, uh, they increase quite considerably. Now I'm not moving my hand, I'm just sitting perfectly still here. Okay, now, I guess I'm going to have to move around a little bit, but you'll see that the spectrum will actually sit down and stop bouncing around when I stop moving. Okay, so the spectrum has now dropped. We've got laptop screen just decided <laughs> going to screen saver mode I'm going to have to wait for it to settle again okay so you can clearly see the um, the 50 hertz mains signal which is the first spike there this one here has been greatly attenuated um, remember before it was off the scale now it's at about 50 so we've we've lost We've attenuated it by 50 dB. The second harmonic obviously doesn't really change a lot because um, it's a 50 hertz filter. And the third harmonic doesn't really change a lot either, although it probably does change a little bit. But anyway, the main one that we wanted to get rid of a little bit was the, uh, the very first one. Now keep in mind, when you're up on a mountain somewhere far away where you would uh, actually receive the Schumann uh, resonance, you wouldn't actually have too much 50 hertz um, signal so generally you're looking for a place where you don't have any 50 hertz signal at all or very very small amounts of it even without the 50 hertz filter okay now at this stage of the game we bring into effect a digital function generator which will generate the signal that we want at uh, at one hertz. Now at the moment it's set to 10 kilohertz, so I'll just stop the video because I, I really don't have, uh, I need both hands to set that down to uh, say one hertz for starters. I'll just stop the video and I'll come back to it in a second. Okay, so we've got, we're back again with the function generator on. We've got a, well this is one kilohertz here. So this is the one hertz here. So at the moment it's set to 1 hertz, about 16 volt output, which is fairly low sort of power. And we've got the output. Now, 
what's left to do now? Obviously, there's no. If I stop moving, you see the spectrum will drop to where it should be. Okay, so there's nothing happening there. So what we need to do now, we're going to connect up an antenna to the output of the signal generator. Now, this is not a very good way of doing things, but I do have a an antenna out there which I use for shortwave. And as long as I connect it only to the center conductor, it actually produces a signal, and which we can actually receive. Now, as I say, at the moment it's set to one hertz. So if we watch the display now, I'll have to sneak up on it and then stop moving for a bit. You see the background falls away, and you can you should be able to clearly see a spike there at the one hertz position. Now it's not very strong at the moment. So I might turn that, turn the gain of the uh, sound card up just a little bit. So yeah, there, there's the one hertz signal. Now that's being transmitted over the air uh, from the signal generator. It's a function generator. It's connected to a coaxial cable, which is connected to a window antenna outside. And that one hertz signal is being received by that antenna there, which is only very short at the moment. So it doesn't really need to be long. The output of that one hertz is actually going through a uh, 50 hertz notch filter, just to knock down the 50 hertz to stop the uh, sound card from getting overloaded. He has decided to uh, stop again. What I might do is I might increase that frequency just a little bit, just to 5 hertz, which for all intents and purposes uh, is still the same thing. It's still a crazy frequency to be transmitting on. And I'll just make the spectrum a little bit easier to see. Nice, look at that. for that to drop down. There we go. If I get a little bit closer to the screen, you can see 5 hertz, and we've got our nice little spike at 5 hertz. I'll move the uh... okay. Yeah, it's not right on it. Somewhere around there. Anyway, that's five hertz minus thirty six dBm. So there we are. We're transmitting at five hertz now. If I increase the frequency here from five to something a little bit higher, like 30. You notice that as you go higher in frequency, the efficiency of the whole thing becomes a lot better. So the signal increases.